All right, as we continue our sermon series from Ecclesiastes, uh, we are looking today at chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. I will be reading from the King James Version, and this is the word of God for the people of God. Verse 4, I made me great works, I builded me houses, I planted me vineyards, I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I get me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. Let's pray. Father God, I pray right now that this this message that you have uh, administered and uh, are ready to deliver to your people, that it be the message uh, that their hearts uh, welcome and open up today. Use me as, as your faithful and obedient messenger to, to relay to them uh, the words of life. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week uh, we looked at the first three verses here in uh, chapter 2 of Ecclesiastes, and we saw that the author, who again calls himself the preacher, or in some translations, the teacher, decided that he would see if pleasure, that is actively and constantly pursuing those things that bring about the experience of enjoyment, feeling good, being happy, that if that would bring fulfillment, satisfaction, and meaning to life, Here under the sun, the phrase that he uses repeatedly. Now along those lines, he also investigated laughter in his pursuit of pleasure, not just the act of laughing itself, uh, but those experiences uh, or activities that would bring the feelings and reactions of laughter. And we also saw that he experimented with alcohol, uh, wine specifically, uh, as a means of finding pleasure within his body, although not to the extent of drunkenness. No, this was a calculated test on the preacher's part, not just an attempt to overindulge in alcohol, to escape perhaps from the reality of life, or to become intoxicated to the point of not knowing and not caring what was going on or even what was happening. Those results uh, are just temporary and fleeting, and never bring about true lasting fulfillment or satisfaction. That is to fill the longing that God has placed in all of our hearts. And he tells us, the preacher does, that all these tests were futile and worthless, but he never gave us real concrete examples. But today in the five verses that follow, we'll get a glimpse, a glimpse at specific activities that he pursued in his test of pleasure being the end all be all, answer to fulfillment and the meaning of life. Now, but before we jump into those verses, let me remind you about the concept of balance, balance and purpose that I mentioned last week, sticking again with that topic of alcohol. It is clear in the Bible that the very existence of alcohol is not evil, nor is its consumption a sin. Let me say that again. It is very clear in the Bible that the very existence of alcohol is not evil, nor is its consumption a sin. But when overly used or abused, when people use it for purposes other than what God intended, then it does become a sin. So it is critical to keep that principle in mind, the principle or the concept of balance and purpose in mind as we work our way through this journey that Solomon undertakes in search of meaning and satisfaction to life. So let's see what Solomon tried. Take a look at verse four. The ESV says, I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. Now we know that Solomon became king of Israel following the death of his father, David. We also know that Solomon was granted wisdom and great riches from God. And typical of great kings, Solomon engaged in numerous building projects. 
Do you remember what David wanted to build when he was still alive? That's right, the temple. A permanent and glorious structure to replace the portable tent of meeting where God in the Holy of Holies could reside where he, God, would dwell with his people and his people could worship as well as draw strength in knowing that their God was with them as their provider and as their protector. But God prohibited David from building the temple, telling him through the prophet Nathan, this comes from 2 Samuel verses 7, 12 through 13, when your days are fulfilled, and you lie down with your fathers, translation, when you die, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And the offspring of David that was granted the privilege of building God's house was none other than Solomon. It is often referred to as Solomon's temple, in fact, because he oversaw the building of it. But it was truly God's temple and it was truly magnificent. Solomon spared no cost. If you were to go back and look in 1 Kings chapters 5 through 6, you will see that there were over 180,000 men who worked on it, with 3,300 officers of Solomon who directly oversaw the work and the workers. It took seven years to build. But that's not all he built. He built houses too. He built a palace for himself, which took 13 years. He built the house of the forest of Lebanon, which was 150 feet long, by 75 feet wide, by 40 feet tall. I'm sorry, 45 feet tall. He built the hall of pillars, the hall of the thrones, the hall of the judgment, and a house for the daughter of Pharaoh, one of his 700 wives. Solomon was, re was responsible for many other building projects, but this gives you a taste of what it means when he writes, I built houses. Solomon also inherited vineyards from his father David. But verse 4 tells us also that Solomon built vineyards. Now I checked in the Bible and I couldn't find a number or a size. But based on his passion for grand building projects, we can assume that they were vast. And an achievement that was fitting and worthy of a king of his stature. And was likely perhaps the source of his wine experiment from back in verse 3. Now, moving on to verse 5, we see that Solomon was also into other agricultural aspects besides vineyards and wine. Verse 5 says, I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. Now, when Nicole and I were in Rome, there was a street alongside the ancient Roman Forum ruins that had these giant trees on either side of the road. I have no idea what kind of trees they were or how old they were but they were really magnificent. Likewise, up on Palatine Hill, which overlooks the Forum, there are two palaces of former Roman emperors there, and right in front of them is a huge garden area full of plants and flowers and shrubs and trees that were just breathtaking. Think about the White House, the Rose Garden, the Ellipse. There is natural beauty with respect to vegetation, as well as a tremendous cost with respect to the land it takes up, as well as the maintenance needed to keep it looking good. Rulers traditionally demonstrate their power and boast about their position through the natural beauty of things like gardens and parks, which Solomon engaged in as well. We see here, we see here that he also planted fruit trees, undoubtedly for the produce but perhaps also for the shade to sit under during a hot Middle Eastern summer day when there was no air conditioning. And what do plants and trees need in order to grow and thrive? Well, look at verse six. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. 
Now, I'm sure that most, if not all of you, have heard about the water problems in Texas, and in particular Houston, uh, that they're having right now as a result of the frigid weather they encountered this week, and which caused water pipes to burst, leaving many without water, even today. And for those that do have water, many of them are still under a mandate to boil their water, to remove the contaminants before being safe for drinking. And we certainly need to continue to keep them in our prayers. Still, nothing has changed over 3,000 years ago. We, people, still need water to survive. And clean drinking water is not always easily accessible or even available, perhaps, where you build your home or your palace or your garden. So if you want water to drink and bathe in, or water for your vineyard, your flowers, your fruit trees, you have to build a system to get the water from point A to point B, which Solomon did as well. After going through all the effort of claiming the land and plant the various types of flowers, trees, and veg vegetation, he had to go the extra step of keeping it alive and thriving and pleasing to the eyes, to the lips, and to the stomach. Now, verses 7 through 8 are primarily intended to illustrate the vastness of Solomon's wealth, which certainly was used to contribute and pay for his pursuit of pleasure, as well as the overall management of his kingdom. And so, verse 7 from the, from the King James translation says the following, I got me servants and maidens, and had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle, above all that were in Jerusalem before me. Now, excuse me, I got me realistically means I bought or I redeemed, which is why in other English translations, the words servants, maidens, and servants born in my house are translated as male and female slaves. So let's just pause there just for a moment. There are a lot of places in the Bible that talk about having slaves. It is my understanding at the slavery system it typically, typically is describing is from the practice of indentured servants or debt servants or bond servants, which means someone who sells themselves to pay off a debt in which the person is eventually released from when they have worked off their debt to the new debt holder. There are also numerous Old Testament passages which describe how someone is to be released from their debt, slavery, after seven years, regardless of whether the debt is paid off or not. As you can see, this is not, this is not the slavery system that was in effect here in the United States. The point that the preacher is trying to make here is that by the way they measured wealth back in those days with servants and possessions of flocks and herds, he was very wealthy, far wealthier than any king, tribal leader, or other ruler there in Jerusalem before him. In fact, the dedication of the temple actually gives us a small glimpse into Solomon's true wealth with respect to livestock. In 1 Kings chapter 8, we find out that Solomon offered up, you ready? 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep as peace offerings to the Lord at that dedication. Now, of these animal sacrifices, a small portion of each was actually burned on the bronze altar there in the temple, but the rest of the meat from the animals was available to be eaten by the people. And along with the rest of the offerings and the rest of the food that, that was made available, the feast and celebration following the dedication of Solomon's temple went on for seven days. That's a lot of meat. <laughs> That's a lot of meat. So again, we take from this that Solomon was extremely wealthy. 
Moving on then to verse eight, he continues boasting about his wealth as he writes, I also gathered from myself silver and gold and the treasures of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. Second Chronicles tells us that all of Solomon's drinking vessels were made of gold, as were all the drinking vessels in the house of the force of Lebanon that he had built. This man had so much silver and gold that 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 15 says the following, And the king made silver and gold as common in Jerusalem as stone, and he made cedar as plentiful as the sycamore of the Shephelah, as common as stone. Now that's pretty remarkable. And from the queen of Sheba, to all the kingdoms immediately surrounding him, kings and provinces brought him treasures of silver and gold, various garments, myrrh, spices, horses, and mules. And they may not have had Pandora or Spotify back then, but he was also able to have male and female singers to entertain them at banquets and other social festivals. Now the last part here of verse 8 poses a translation issue which you may have already picked up on. In the King James Version, it is translated as musical instruments to go along with the idea of the male and female singers, whereas in most of the other translations, it is rendered as concubines or harems, referring to women or maidens for the purpose of sexual intimacy, all for the delight of the sons of man. Regardless of how it is translated in your Bible, and there are certainly no deep theological doctrines dependent on this translation. The point remains the same. This man was incredibly wealthy. He wanted for nothing. He had whatever he wanted. And apparently, he wanted and he had a lot. Now, if you've been reading in your Bible and listening carefully as I went through those five verses... You will have noticed something that I have purposely skipped over. Something that is a little easier, I think, to see in the ESV translation as compared to the King James, but is still there nonetheless. Do you see the phrases, I made me, I builded me, I made me again, I got me, I gathered me, and I gat me. In the ESV, the word that is used or implied in those instances is myself, as in, I built houses for myself, I planted vineyards for myself, and I gathered for myself. Solomon is not going about any of these activities in order to be a kind or benevolent king. He's not doing these things for his people. He's not even doing it for his nation. He's not even doing it for his God. He's doing these things for himself. In the pursuit of pleasure, for the purpose of finding satisfaction, fulfillment, and meaning in life. And he wasn't the only one who tried to do it during his time, before his time, or even after his time. But he certainly had the means to go about it with a passion that few others could even fathom, much less attempt. Sadly, even today, we too can get caught up in this trap, trying to find meaning or significance in things that promise, promise to please us, promise to bring us enjoyment, promise to bring us happiness. Again, most of us, don't have the means or the resources to be able to go to the extremes like Solomon did. But that doesn't mean that we don't try at times. Do you constantly have building projects going on at your house? Is your life a series of projects going from one to another to another, a seemingly endless journey that never brings true satisfaction? What about your grass? your garden, your trees? Is the maintenance and upkeep on them increasing or decreasing? 
Have you found yourself perhaps thinking you need more room for your plants, your flowers, and more, and more trees? Or maybe it's time to install a gazebo or a fountain or an endless waterfall. Do you find yourself with less and less time to get things done because you have more and more things to take care of? Are you constantly looking for new ways to acquire more wealth, putting faith and trust in material here on earth that is used as common pavement in heaven? Or what about entertainment and amusement? Do you need one more premium movie channel or one more hobby or perhaps one more big boy or big girl toy to make you happy and satisfied? Again, brothers and sisters, none of these things that I'm mentioning, and I'm certainly not picking on anybody, but none of these things in and of themselves is evil or sinful. But it's the constant pursuit of any of these things or things like them where the purpose is self-satisfaction, trying to find meaning and fulfillment in things that have no eternal value and have no hope of ever giving you what you are truly looking for. That's when it becomes a sin. That's when it turns you away from God. That's when it becomes a problem. These things became a big problem for Solomon. And if we aren't careful, and if we aren't aware of the dangers or even the tactics of the enemy, then we too can end up pursuing things that are dangerous and deadly. Next week, we'll see what Solomon learned from this part of his journey, where he succeeded or had positive results, and where he failed or had negative results, that we, you and I, may learn from both so as to keep our eyes wide open and fixed on Jesus and avoid the treacherous snares of the enemy who seeks only to deceive and blind us. Please join us next week as we continue seeking God's wisdom, guidance, and direction for each of our lives. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for truth. We thank you for the loving care that you have for us, that you would pursue us which, with such passion to help us to be able to see truth, to avoid dangers, to turn from the temptations of the world, the temptations of the evil one, that we may not be deceived, that we may not fall into the traps. Father, we thank you that even when we do, that, that you are there ready to help us out. That as we are ready to confess, that you are ready to, to forgive. As we are ready to turn from, you are there to be turned to. Lord, we thank you that your love is unconditional. We thank you that you loved us before we even thought about loving you. We thank you that Jesus loved us so much and thought so much about us that you didn't have to force him to come down here. You didn't have to twist his arm. You didn't have to bribe him. You didn't have to do any of that. He wanted to come. And he didn't give it 50% or 75% or even 99%. He gave his all. His all. So that those that are here in this house today and those outside of it and those that still tell God to talk to the hand, that we may all have the opportunity to be reconciled. Lord, we thank you for truth. We thank you for caring enough about us that you would help us to see and not be blinded by the enemy. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.